Hey everyone, today we are tearing down an MSI 1070 Ti Duke card. I have not worked with any of their cards from the Duke line in a while, uh, but this is a new one. So this is a, I think they're officially calling this a tri frozer cooler now, as opposed to twin frozer. It's got three fans. The third one overhangs the PCB a bit, which allows it to push air obviously through and past the PCB. And uh, we're gonna take it apart and see what it looks like underneath. Look at the VRM, look at the cooling solution and all of that. This one is about MSRP. It's about $470, $480. So a bit below 1080, a bit above reference card. And the 1070 Ti, just to reiterate in our review, we think that it's, it's sort of a misunderstood card. The initial rhetoric around the 1070 Ti was, why does this thing exist? There's a 1080, there's a 1070. We kind of are of the opinion that, uh, like in my review of it, that the 1070 Ti, as long as it's 450 to 470, 480 dollars, it makes more sense than 1080s because they're roughly the same performance and you can overclock it in five minutes and get equivalent performance even with an overclock 1080. So we're going to take this one apart today. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our coffee lake temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds for use on top of the IHS, like cryonaut and hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. So starting out externally with the cooler, it is a three fan design, and these are smaller fans. They are not the usual 90 to 100 millimeter fans that the twin frozer coolers have. Uh, they're a bit smaller than that. So if we do a, a quick measurement of these fans, we will get, let's see roughly how big they are. It's about 85, 85, so that means in, in marketing materials, they're gonna call that 90, because that's probably about 90, yeah. So about 85 millimeters, call it 90. And uh, the usual twin frozer fans are a little bit bigger than this. I think they're 100 millimeters these days. So they, they do run a bit larger than these fans do. But there's three of these, so you can't fit two larger 100 millimeter fans with them. For power, it's got a six and an eight. It's got a uh, traditional backplate, some LEDs, no BIOS switch, so there's no dual BIOS. Lots of just Phillips screws, it looks like. And then we've got some heat pipes and a standard heat sink over there. So I've pretty much seen the whole card at this point. Let's take it apart and get the actual details. For this, I am going to be using our anti-static mod mat because now that it is cold and dry, we are routinely shocking things in the studio. Like actually, not even from just advertising our own product perspective, we are legitimately, uh, particularly Andrew behind the camera, camera, God damn it. particularly Andrew behind the camera, we're shocking every tripod, every table, uh, but that's where the wrist strap has come in actually quite handy. We've got the anti-static mod mat on store.gamersnexus.net slash mod mat if you would like one and cold and dry is the weather that harbors static electricity. So we're gonna be a bit safer today than normally. Okay, so all those screws I just took out, including this one, are going through the back plate, through the PCB, where's the unthreaded part, and then into the base plate. So these are retaining the base plate to the card as well as the back plate. Now we need to remove the cooling portion. So we got the four standard spring tension screws for that. Warranty void sticker, which are awful and not really enforceable in a lot of places. So, okay, we've removed the back plate. This is another one of those where it's not gonna do a ton for you in terms of heat transfer, because there's really no way to transfer the heat to the plate. It's just there for looks primarily. This is not a thermally conductive surface. It's coated for a few reasons, primarily that they're probably trying to avoid direct shorts by bridging any of the pins. But a thermal pad in there would do a whole lot of good to transfer heat. So not particularly effective as a cooling solution, but then again, not a lot of hot components on the back of the card. So let's see if they are somewhat redeemed on the front of the card where it really counts. And we've got a couple of fans we're gonna have to disconnect first. Okay, that was trivial. All right, so cooling solution and base plate. And we'll take this off in a moment, but let's take a look first. 
So capacitor bank, most of it, other than the last cap and the last choke. Most of the cap bank and the inductor line do have thermal pads that, as you can see by the impressions from the lines going down them, they do contact the heat sink. And before someone says, well, wait a minute, there's not a lot of surface area there. All you're doing is contacting the fins. That doesn't do anything. It actually does quite a lot. We tested this with the EVGA ACX cards with a thermal pad mod around this, no, actually uh, end of year 2016, we tested that. And it matters. This helps a lot. I mean, it's better than air. Air is not really thermally conductive. You're at like 0.2 or 0.24 watts per meter Kelvin at 25C. Uh, whereas aluminum, you're going to be upwards of 200. So it's certainly better than than nothing or than uh, just air. And you can see that they also contact the heat pipes a bit, which is probably the most helpful, as those are going to be um, what does your phase change. So it, it helps. It'd probably be a bit better to have a flat plate, but it depends on how much the airflow matters here versus just straight contact to pull heat away. And we'll know more about that once we look at the VRM components. Uh, so yeah, they do actually have those contacting the heat sink, which is something I was genuinely worried about until just now because some of the cheaper MSI cards in the past, like the Armor, which uses a great PCB, uh, they don't do a great job at ensuring contact between electrical or power components and heat sinks. So uh, that's, that's done at least reasonably. This is just looks like for vibration damping or potentially uh, reducing coil wind, although I, I would say probably vibration damping for the most part. As far as the rest of the components, we have an LED cable and a fan cable. Uh, got some grease leaching around the outside of the substrate. And what is this doing? All right, so that hook is going in here into this sort of socket. And uh, it's got a rubber finish on it, so it's not really for thermal transfer. That's not to improve transfer to this flat fin. It's just probably for vibration damping and physical support of the heat sink would be my guess. And, uh, and reduce any unwanted noises from the fans. Other than those, you know, we need to get underneath the base plate. The base plate has some minimal level of surface area. Not a whole lot, though. Uh, it's it's certainly helpful to have, but it's not a not the best base plate we've seen. This is also a cheaper card as far as cards go these days. It's not like the uh, high-end ICX cards that kind of cost a lot more and have the pin fins. The MSI Lightning does the same idea with the small fins on the base plate. So we've got our memory modules as expected that contact the aluminum base plate. Nothing special there. So let's kind of move this to the side. So for the VRM, we'll talk about this more in the review of the card, but this is using eight of the Siliconix ZF906 MOSFETs, which are integrated high and low side dual FETs. And then there are two more MOSFETs over here for the memory. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the layout and the phase design in the review uh, if Buildzoid doesn't do a standalone video for us. Kind of depends on how interesting he thinks the card is. So very basics of the VRM there. Talk about that more later. For shunts, if you wanted to short them, we got a couple options. And actually we can check where they go. So there's one shunt here, there's another one here. My guess is that this shunt goes to that power connector, this one probably goes to that one. There's another shunt down here that's gonna cover us for the most part, it looks like. Yes, so that'll cover the shunts. Let me, um... okay, so what we're gonna do here now is just double check and see where the shunts go. This is pretty easy. We explained it in our Titan V shunt shorting mod, but if you missed that, it's the same process here. So I'm going to check for resistance using just a cheap digital multimeter. We don't need anything too accurate because uh, all we're checking for is a zero value or a non-zero value. And if we look at the side over here of the mod mat, I'll show you what we need to check. So we need to check for a 12-volt line, which is any of these yellow lines. This is on our mat. We've got GPU power here for these two. So the six-fit pin, we've got the lower three. For the eight pin, we've got these three. Uh, so we need to check one of those and then check that against either side of the shunt. So let's just go ahead and do that now. 
So I'm going to try and sneak this down to that second leg as opposed to the green one. Green one's a uh, sense, so we don't want to hit that. Okay, so this is a zero value. So this shunt does go to this six pin. Uh, it zeroes out when I measure it. And then for this one over here, we're also getting a zero when we measure it. It's just a trick of being able to get in there and hit the contact. So we're zeroing out here. Zero resistance, they are, uh, these shunts are basically, as we explained in the shunt shorting video, they're in line with the power line. So uh, this shunt is in line with that eight pin. This one's in line with that six pin. If you put some liquid metal atop each of these, you can short them out and that will uh, trick the card into thinking it's pulling less current than it is. The more liquid metal you put, the more you are changing the resistance, which will impact how much more current it can draw. If you put too much liquid metal or you do a direct short with a copper wire, for example, then depending on the gauge of the wire or the length of it, you could end up forcing the card into 2D clocks because it'll uh, go into safety mode. But that, that'd be what you'd short if you wanted to short it out and trick it into drawing more power and pushing more current down the rails. So that is the MSI 1070 Ti Duke card. We're going to try and review this one. Uh, CES is coming up very soon, so we'll see what happens with that. But we'll try and look at it for sure. It's mostly just a question of the thermal performance at this point. because That's really all that matters with these cards. So uh, taking it apart will allow us to put thermal couples on the VRMs and see how it does cooling those compared to its competition. And as always, if you want more information, you can subscribe to catch follow-ups. And CES coverage, go to store.gamersnexus.net slash modmat to pick up a mat like the one we used in this video. And you can help us out directly on patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.